Section 23 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Dempsey, Highland, New York. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930, by Various. Vagabonds of Space. Chapter 9. Nemesis. The Lada did not use their ray pistols. They were too busy attempting to elude the mad rushes of the powerful terrestrial. Besides, there were good reasons they should not kill him. Yet. Carr drove one of them halfway down the passage with a well-planted punch. The other was on his back, hairy legs twined around his waist, an arm under his chin, drawing his head back with a steady and terrible pressure. He whirled around, trying to shake off his beastly antagonist. But these powerful legs and arms held fast. He tore at the hairy ankles where they crossed in the pit of his stomach, wrenched them free. Still the creature clung to him, twisting his head until it seemed his neck might break. He found a waving foot with his right hand, wrenched it mightily. There was a sharp snap, and the foot dangled limp in his fingers. He had broken the ankle. With a howl of pain, his assailant let go and dropped to the floor to crawl away like a whipped cur. In a flash, Carr saw that the brute was reaching for his ray pistol where it had dropped during the encounter. He kicked it from the reach of that hairy paw and sprang after it. With one of those little weapons in his hands, the odds would change. His fingers closed on its grip just as Aura rushed into the room, closely followed by Rapaju, whose distorted features were terrible to behold. The cabin was full of them now. The guard he had first knocked down, the lust-crazed commander, the one with the broken ankle, all but Didus and Mado. Carr faced them alone. So close was Rapaju to the girl that he dared not use the pistol. And now the uninjured guard was circling him, trying to get in a position where he could use his ray pistol without endangering his commander. Carr fumbled for the release of the weapon he held in his hand. Found it. The guard threw himself on the floor when he saw it raised, shouted a warning, but it was too late. The deadly ray had sped on its mission of death struck him full in the middle. The twisted body lay still a moment, and then collapsed, like a punctured balloon, leaving his scant clothing in a limp heap, empty. A worthy miniature of the D-ray, this little weapon. He turned to face Rabaju and saw that he was shielding himself with Aura's body. She had fainted and now hung drooping in the arms of the beast. Where was Mado? Didis? Good God, he'd killed them! Carr thought of that little spot on the chart must be very close now. They'd pass so near there'd be no escape. But he could not reach the controls without taking his eyes from Rapaju. That would have to wait. Rapaju was backing toward the door, still holding the limp figure of the girl before him. The injured Gar lay moaning on the floor. Drop her, you devil! Carr shouted desperately as he saw that Rapaju soon would reach the passageway. Then suddenly he reached for the controls and pushed the energy lever to full speed forward. He braced himself for the shock of acceleration and saw Rapaju and Aura thrown backward into the passageway, the girl's body cushioned by that of her captor as they were flung violently to the floor. Madly he rushed to the narrow entrance and tore at the hairy arms that encircled the slender waist of the girl. He jerked the snarling commander of the Lada expedition to his feet and slammed him against the metal wall. Now you damn pig! he grunted. I'll finish the job, dirty scum of a rotten world. He dragged his victim into the control cabin and threw him to the floor. But Rapaju was like an eel. He wriggled from under him and snatched from the heap of clothing the ray pistol of the disintegrated guard. With a yelp of triumph he rose to his knees and leveled the weapon. A well-placed kick sent it spinning and Carr was upon him. He snapped back the head with a terrible punch, then lifted the dazed creature to his feet and stepped back. Stand up and take it like a man, he roared. Rapaju shook his head to clear it, and rushed in with a bellow of rage, just what Carr had wanted. Starting almost from the floor, his right came up to meet the vicious jaw with a crack that told of the terrific power behind it. Lifted from his feet and hurled halfway across the room by the impact, Rapaju lay motionless where he fell. Carr was at the telescope. Their speed was close to fifteen hundred miles a second. The monstrous mass of Mado's Sargasso Sea loomed close in his vision. 
off their course by a hundred miles or more. They'd miss it all right. He had the situation in hand now on board the Nomad, but how about the fleet behind them? He thought fast and furiously. Another two minutes and they'd pass the thing, the inexplicable horror which had accounted for the golden sphere of the Europans. Could he use it? Suppose the fleet of the enemy... The idea was full of possibilities. He rushed to the stern compartment and scanned the heavens for the massed bodies of spheres he knew would be the fleet of the Lada. At this speed they must have fallen far behind. Yes, they were there. Not so far behind at that. The battle in the control room must have been a shorter one than it had seemed. He returned quickly to the controls and reversed the energy to give the fleet a chance to catch up to him. Closer came that mass of whitish jelly, and now it was much larger than before. The terrible creature, for living matter it was, beyond doubt, was growing with the rapidity of a rising flood. Great tentacles of its horrid translucent substance reached in all directions for possible victims. He sickened at the sight. But what a fate for the fleet of the Lada, if only he could maneuver them into its influence. He changed his course slightly and headed directly for the monster, again increasing speed. Perhaps, if he calculated the forces correctly, he could dive through it again with the D-ray to clear a path. But no, it was a miracle they had escaped before, and now the vicious thing was more than double its previous size. Once more he altered his course. He'd cross in front of the thing, skim it as close as he dared, and shoot from its influence on the far side. The greater mass of the enemy vessels and their lack of a quick-acting repulsive force would prove their undoing. Full speed ahead. A rapid mental calculation. An educated guess, rather. And he set the automatic control. Turning around to start for the stern compartment, he saw that Aura had recovered from her swoon and now stood swaying weakly in the passageway. Aura! he exclaimed delightedly. He rushed to her side and supported her in a tender embrace. Rapajou? she questioned with horror in her eyes. Won't bother you for a while, dear. But your father, Mado. He gasped them. They'll recover. The brave girl had regained her composure. Good, but come, time's short. He half carried her to the rear, berating himself the while for his inability to pay her closer attention. With arms still around her, he placed her at one of the stern ports. What is it, Carr? She sensed his excitement. The fleet, see, will destroy them. The spherical vessels were close behind, huddled together in mass formation and following the nomad blindly. How, Carr? Lead them into it. Wait till you see. There's a... The nomad lurched and changed direction. Cold fear clutched at his throat. That devil of a guard! Why hadn't he killed him? He dashed through the passage, Aura at his heels. Sure enough, the crippled guard had dragged himself to the controls, was manipulating the energy director as he had seen Mado do. They were heading directly for the terrible monster of the heavens. No need now to peer through the telescope. The thing was visible to the naked eye. No power could save them. Carr hurled himself at the guard and tore at the hairy paw which gripped the lever. The throbbing of strange energies filled the air of the room, and Carr's brain pulsed with the maddening rhythm. The red discharge appeared at the projections of the control panels. He forgot the fleet of the Lada, forgot the menace to his own world. Only Aura mattered now, and he had not the power to save her. As in a daze he knew he was wrenching mightily at the body of the powerful minion of Rapajou. His fingers encountered heated metal, one of the ray pistols. He felt the intense vibration of the weapon as its charge was released, but he still lived. The beast who held it had missed. Dimly he was conscious of the screams of Aura, of the yielding of the creature who fought him. An animal cry registered on his consciousness, and he shook the suddenly limp Lada from him. He knew somehow that his last enemy was gone. A quick glance showed him that Aura was still on her feet, braced against the wall. The red veil was before his eyes. He grasped the controls and fought desperately to keep his strength and senses. A streamer of horrid whiteness swung across his vision, slithered clamily over the glass of one of the forward ports. They were into the thing. It was the end. 
He groaned aloud as he fumbled with the mechanisms and strove to formulate a plan of escape. The fleet he knew was just behind, an enormous mass. The repulsive energy astern would be terrific. He turned it full on. The whiteness obscured his vision, then it was gone once more. A single streamer waved before him and encompassed them. The movement of these members must be inconceivably rapid, else they'd be invisible at the speed the nomad was traveling. Full speed ahead. The repulsion full on in the direction of the center of the mass as well as astern. The framework of the nomad creaked protestingly from the terrific forces that tore at her vitals. Then, suddenly, they were released. The nomad was shooting off into space. The resultant of those combined forces had done the trick. Only the edge of that devilfish of space had they touched. Free. They were free of the monster. The red veil lifted. He rushed to Aura's side. She was kneeling at one of the floor ports, breathing heavily, but unharmed. Below them they saw the swiftly receding mass, the fleet of the Lada diving headlong, drawn inexorably into the rapacious embrace of that vile creature of the heavens. An instant the awful whiteness of the thing closed in greedily about the many spheres of the fleet, swallowed them from sight and contorted madly and with seeming glee over the triumph. Then, in a burst of blinding incandescence, it was gone. The monster, the fleet, everything, blasted into nothingness. The fuel storage compartments of the vessels of Ganymede had exploded. The heavens were rid of the inexplicable growing menace. The inner planets were saved from a terrible invasion, and the nomad was safe. Aura, Didis, Mado, all were safe. At his side, Aura was trembling. Gently he raised her to her feet and took her into his arms. Chapter 10 Vagabonds All Together they cared for Didis and Mado, made them comfortable in their bunks until the time when the effects of the gas would wear off. Luckily it was that Rapaju had used the gas pistol rather than the ray. Perhaps it had been a mistake. Or perhaps he had needed the scientific knowledge of Didis, the familiarity with the inner planets that was Mado's. At any rate, they had no delusions regarding his designs on Aura, or his hatred of Carr. By his own passions had the commander of the fleet been led to the error that cost him his life and made possible the destruction of his fleet. By his own passions had the commander of the fleet been led to the error that cost him his life and made possible the destruction of his fleet. Carr was torn by conflicting emotions. The delectable little Europan was most disturbing. He'd never had much use for the other sex, on Earth, too dominating most of them, and always thrown at his head by designing parents for his money. But Aura was different. Her very nearness set his pulses racing, and he knew that she cared for him as he did for her. Those moments in the control cabin after the explosion. But something had come over him since he cut loose from the old life. Wanderlust. That was it. He'd never go back. Neither would he be content to settle down to a domestic life in Paladar. Wanted to be up and going somewhere. Oh, Carr! Carr! Aura's voice called to him. Mado is awake. He wants you. Good old Mado. Why couldn't they just continue on their way as they had started out? Roaming the universe in search of other adventures? but the silvery tinkling of Aura's laughter reached his ears. She was irresistible. He forgot his doubts as he hurried to his friend's cabin. Mado was staring at the European maiden with a ludicrous expression of astonishment. Gawping, Carr called it, and Aura was laughing at him. Your friend, she gurgled, doesn't believe he's alive, or that I am, or you. Tell him we are. Carr grinned. Mado did look funny at that. Hello, old sock, he said. Had a bad dream. Did I? Oh, boy! Mado rocked to and fro, his head in his hands. Then he displayed sudden intense interest. Rapperjou, he asked. His guards. The fleet. What's happened? Ha-ha! 
Now you know you're alive, Carr laughed. But the others are dead and gone. The fleet's gone to smash, and how? But Carr, how did you do it? Tell me. Your Sargasso Sea did it, and it's a thing of the past, too. Wait till I tell you about it. Aura tripped from the room as Carr sat on the edge of the bunk to spin his yarn. But man alive! Mado exclaimed when the story was finished. Don't you know you've done a miraculous thing? I'd never have had the nerve. That damn creature out there had more than four times its former attracting energy. That's what made it impossible for the fleet to get away. And you, you lucky devil, you just doped it out right. The fleet of the Lotta gave you a tremendous push from astern when you used the repulsive energy. If they hadn't been there with their enormous mass to react against, we'd all have been mincemeat now along with the Lotta. You terrestrials sure can think fast. Me now. Lord, if it had been me, I'd have thought of it after my spirit had departed to its reward. Or punishment. Glory be. It's the greatest thing I ever heard of. Rats. You'd have done the same thing as I did. Probably would have missed it a mile instead of nearly getting caught as I did. Good thing the fleet's gone, though. Mars and Terra. Venus, too. They'll never know how close it was for them. Wouldn't have sense enough to appreciate it anyway. They would if they ever got a taste of what the lot of planned. But what's wrong with you, Carr? You act sore. Want to go home? Me? Don't be like that. No, I'd like to carry on as we planned. There's Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune yet. Planet Nine. A flock of satellites and asteroids. Oh, damn it. Mado looked his amazement. Well, what's to prevent it? he demanded. The nomad's still here, and so are we. I'm just as anxious to keep going as you are. Why not? But Carr did not reply. Why not, indeed? He strode from the cabin and into the control room. The nomad was drifting in space, subject only to natural forces that swung it in a vast orbit around the sun. He started the generators and drove the vessel from her temporary orbit with rapid acceleration. Out out into the jeweled blackness of the heavens. There was Jupiter out there, a bright orb that came suddenly very near when he centered it on the crosshairs of the telescope. The excited voices of Aura and Didis came to his ears, the booming speech of Mado. Why couldn't he be sensible and companionable as they were? But a perverse demon kept him at the controls. They'd think him a grouch. Well, maybe he was. But the vastness of the universe beckoned, New worlds to explore, mysteries to be solved, a life of countless new experiences. Anyone would think he was the owner of the Nomad the way he planned for the future. They were in the control cabin now, Mado and Didis and Aura. A moment he hesitated, eyes glued to the telescope. Then, with a petulant gesture, he reached for the automatic control. Locked it. Shouldn't be this way. They'd think him an awful cad, and they'd be right. He whirled to face them. Thetis was smiling. Mado gazed owlishly solemn. Aura clung to the arms of her father, and her long lashes hid the blue eyes that had played such havoc with the emotions of the terrestrial. Car, Thetis said gently, we must thank you. You saved our lives, you know. Oh, forget it. Saved my own, too, didn't I? By a lucky break. It wasn't luck, Carr. Thetis was gripping his hand now. It was sheer grit and brains. You had them both. If you hadn't used them, we'd all be corpses. Or disintegrated. Excepting Aura, perhaps. And you know the fate that awaited her. Instead, we are alive and well. The fleet is gone. Rapaju's body and that of his guard drift nameless in space where you disposed of them through the airlock of the Nomad. The inner planets need fear no future invasion, for the resources of the Ganymede have been expended in the one huge enterprise that has failed, all through your quick wit and bravery. No, it wasn't luck. Nonsense, Didis. Carr returned the pressure of the scientist's hand, smiling sheepishly. He pushed him away after a moment. He didn't want their gratitude or praise. Didn't know what he wanted. Aura still avoided meeting his gaze. Nonsense, he repeated. And now, 
Please, leave me. You, Didis, Mado, too. I'd like to be alone for a while. With Aura. Mind? Mado's owlish look broadened to a knowing grin as he backed into the passageway. Didis collided with the huge Martian in his eagerness to be out of the room. They were alone, and Carr was on his feet. Nothing mattered now, excepting Aura. Suddenly she was in his arms, the fragrance of her hair in his nostrils. Stargazing, the two of them, it was ridiculous. But the wonders of the universe held a new beauty now for Carr. The distant suns had taken on added brilliance. Still, they beckoned. Carr? The girl whispered after a time. Where are we going? To Europa. Your home. To... To stay? No. Carr was suddenly confident, determined. We'll stop there to break the news. Then we'll be wedded, you and I, according to the custom of your people. Our honeymoon, years of it, will be spent in the nomad, roving the universe. Mado will agree, I know. Wanderers of the heavens we'll be, Aura, but we'll have each other. And when we've... you've... had enough of it, I'll be ready to settle down. Anywhere you say. Are you game? Oh, Carr, how did you guess? It's just as we'd planned. Father and Mado and I didn't think I'd go, did you, you stupid old dear? Why, why, Aura? Carr was stammering now. He'd thought he was being masterful, making the plans himself, but she'd beat him to it, the adorable little minx. I was a bit afraid, he admitted. And I still can't believe that it's actually true. You're sure you want to? Positive. Why, Carr, I've always been a vagabond at heart. And now that I've found you, we'll just be vagabonds together. Father and Mado will leave us very much to each other. Their scientific leanings, you know. And, oh, it'll just be wonderful. It's you that'll make it wonderful, sweetheart. Carr drew her close. The stars shone still more brightly and beckoned anew. Vagabonds, all of them, like the gypsies of old, but with vastly more territory to roam. The humdrum routine of his old life seemed very far behind. He wondered what Courtney Davis would say if he could see him now. Wordless happiness had come to him, and he let his thoughts wander out into the limitless expanse of the heavens, stargazing still, just he and Dora. End of Vagabonds of Space Part 23 Chapter 10 Recording by Jason Dempsey Highland, New York